<laughs> but instead she asked me questions. Um, okay, so the challenge is, so Anto started talking about plasticity, right? So he talked about the effects of glutamate at NWA receptors and amperin receptors, and the issue is how do they start to change things long term? So how do they start to affect nuclear events um, by changing gene transcription, uh, uh, by changing uh, epigenetic marks that ultimately uh, cause changes in the organism that last for a long time. And so what we know is that a critical part of this uh, is the, uh, this, MEC, this MAP kinase cascade that I uh, summarized a few minutes ago. So some calcium comes in, MDA receptors, there are various ways to get from calcium to RAF activation, but activates MEC, gets phosphorylated, activates ERK, ERK then moves to the nucleus, phosphorylates a bunch of things, which I'll, look, I'll get back to later and, and briefly. So, but can dopamine somehow interact with glutamate and modulate this pathway? So the, this part of the talk is really going to be, what's this question mark and how to resolve it? Yep. Really quick question. Uh, is there any established mechanism by which uh, postsynaptic activity, independent of synaptic transmission, just say, say via voltage-gated calcium channels can activate the same mm -hmm. ERK pathway? Yeah. Can, is that established? Um, so my Greenberg's labs worked on this a fair amount over the years. Um, there are some very interesting pieces of data. In fact, Carl Dieseroff, when he was a student in uh, Dick Chan's lab, worked on this um, this uh, exact thing <coughs> about how this uh, calcium signals could locally activate calcium channels and and calmodulin, the protein calmodulin. And there's this idea that calmodulin may somehow be able to be sequestered in some sort of signaling that will take the signals from calcium channels to the nucleus. So, um, so there, are other, there, are, there are other ways to do this, um, and uh, other receptors can mediate different, uh, different activation pathways. I, I don't, I, I'm going to try to stick to this just for, to make it <coughs> relatively simple. But yeah, the, there are other localized ways that a couple um, local signals to to longer-term nuclear changes, yeah. Some of them work seemingly independently, other words are working synergistically. Okay, so this work um, started, we were, we were very DARP-centric, obviously, we were uh, working with the Giro lab, and uh, this is a, it's a tissue slice from uh, a section from um, uh, striatum um, stain for um, antibodies that recognize the phosphorylated form of DARP at the site, which regulates its act activity of PP1. If you stimulate with a, uh, a psychostimulant like amphetamine, but cocaine would work the same very rapidly, you see increased phosphorylation of DARP32 in a subset of neurons. Those are the ones that contain pre predominantly the D1 receptors. If you look at the activation of ERK in exactly the same sections, what you see is that only a subset of DARP positive, phosphodarp positive cells were positive for ERK. Okay? And the numbers were about, about half of these cells were positive for DARP, of which about 65% were positive also for ERK. Now, interestingly, phosphorylation of ERK, but not DARP, so DARP. Uh, required only D1 receptor activation, but phosphorylation of ERK required NMD receptor activation by infusing antagonists of these receptors into the animals prior to administration of the drug. This was uh, not unique for uh, psychostimulants. Amphetamine and cocaine worked. Uh, and this is looking at ERK activation. Uh, THC works. Morphine works. Nicotine works. We know that there's a critical role for DARP because if we knock out DARP32, we don't see the increases in response to these various drugs um, and some of the quantitation is shown down here. Furthermore, so I mentioned, you know, you have to be careful when you knock out a protein. What happens if your protein has multiple functions? So in this, the field, this sort of field, one of the ways to get around that is to actually make a a targeted knockout where you only mutate one amino acid, in this case the threonine that gets phosphorylated to alanine. Otherwise, all the rest of the protein is the same, the amount is the same. So if you can do that, it's better than knocking out the whole protein because you've only perturbed that one phosphorylation event, or at least you hope you have. So if you look further downstream at the fossil crab, a transcription factor that's important for mediating effects of psychostimulants, either in the, the whole, the null DARP32 knockout, or in the 3 and 34 to alanine mutant, 
you suppress the ability of cocaine to stimulate uh, activation of, of CREB in this case, or another transcription factor called ELK1. ELK um, and uh, su supporting the idea that, that the, there's a, some sort of synergy between the, the DARP D1 pathway and the ERK glutamate pathway that is maintained all the way through to the, um, to the nucleus. You can look at this in a slightly different way. Um, so these are um, uh, local mineral sensitization experiments in a, in a paradigm that the Giraud lab developed, which they call one-shot sensitization, um, which they give one injection, then they look at it two days or seven days later. And you can show that if you do this experiment in the presence of an ERK kinase antagonist um, that competes for the ATP binding site selectively, you block the uh, locomotor sensitization. So, so not only is the, the mech ERK pathway biochemically relevant, it's, it's relevant to the beha elicited behavior. Similarly, if you use the 3 and 34 alanine mutant, you block the potentiation to the single shot uh, sensitization paradigm uh, in terms of locomotor activity. So all these things are definitely interconnected. Um, but what are the what are the mechanisms in detail? And, and this again, this this little bit of the top part of the presentation is really talking about the sig single amplification part and signal selection. Let's let's the components. So at this point, I need to introduce another player. Um, we don't work so much on tyrosine phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, but we do work on a, an enzyme called STEP, which is a striato-enriched tyrosine phosphatase. It's a tyrosine phosphatase that's selected for tyrosine residues. And STEP is so-called because it's very abundant in the same medium spinning neurons as these other signaling pathways. And it's clearly, in these, this simple co-localization study, it's localized when you see PR, you see STEP. And this is in response to amphetamine in, in the commons. I should say we, a lot of this work is done in dorsal striatum, but, but at this type of level analysis, the data is also done in, in either core shell, the commons, and the overall biochemical data is pretty much the same. So STEP is an interesting phosphatase. It comes in two flavors, a bigger flavor called STEP61 and a smaller one called 46. There are splice variants of each other. And others had worked on STEP because it has this interesting structure. as a tyrosine phosphatase domain up here. And it has something called a Kim domain or a kinase interaction motif that turns out this is a, one of these modular domains that recruits the phosphatase to the substrate, namely STEP. And STEP gets phosphorylated by the upstream kinase on a tyrosine and a threonine residue. So by re recruiting STEP to ERK, you can then locally dephosphorylate the tyrosine residue and inactivate STEP. Okay? And we had done other work with the Paul Ambrosos lab at Yale over the years, studying some of the basic biochemistry of this, mostly in slices, stridal slices. But what we knew was that, as I just said, ERK can interact with, sorry, STEP can interact with ERK and dephosphorylate this tyrosine and in cause inactivation. But we also discovered that this PKA site was also a site for pre phosphatase 1, the site, the, the enzyme that is regulated by, by DARP32. And so we knew that PK could phosphorylate STEP, or PP1 could reverse this, allowing STEP to go between an active form and an inactive form. And so we went further um, to see if the PP1 DARP system could be involved in regulating the STEP, which in turn could regulate ERK. In these experiments that were done in uh, whole animals in response to saline or amphetamine uh, short-term uh, uh, acute stimulation. And this slide's a little bit busy, but basically the STEP61, the bigger forms up here, the STEP46 is down here. What we're looking at here is the mobility of an <laughs> SDS page gel. And what you can see if you look at the wild type mice, uh, these are striatal slices, when you stimulate with amphetamine after about 50 minutes, you get this gel shift that's indicative of phosphorylation. We can also use phosphosprinting antibodies to to, to look at this, or in the 46 form, you see this bigger shift. But if you do the same experiment in the DARP knockout mice, you don't get this uh, gel shift. You don't get as much of the, the, the uh, modification. You don't get any phosphorylation. But it was turned out to be more complicated in this, because this is looking at um, step regulation, which step is working at the level of ERK, uh, 
But we also find that, in fact, this uh, DARP system could work upstream of ERK at the MEC level. And so here we're looking at phospho MEC, so that's the upstream kinase to ERK. You do the same experiment, you get uh, dramatic stimulation of phosphorylation of uh, MEC with amphetamine, which is d diminished significantly in the knockout. Not completely, but, but, but significantly in quantitations here. So this is what we started with. This was a question mark that we wanted to answer. And so, in fact, we have the answer, and, and it's, it's, there's a bunch of steps, uh, no, no pun intended, but um, we've got DARP, key downstream from PKA. Inhibition of DARP is able to, uh, sorry, phosphorylation of DARP is able to inhibit, inhibit PP1 at two levels, upstream of, at the level of MEC and downstream at the level of STEP. In both cases, you've got signal amplification occurring here because these are um, inhibiting uh, these phosphatases uh, through, the, the, through this, this cascade of uh, DARP. But then you've got the cumulative effects of um, blocking MEC action, so there's less upstream act activation, but you've got activation of, um, sorry, inactivation of the phosphatase step that then uh, allows, uh, I got this wrong, sorry, you get inhibition of phosphatase 1, you get more MEC activity, you've got inhibition of step, you've got more ERK phosphorylation, and the combination of these gives a much, much larger signal coupling uh, glutamate synergistically to dopamine receptors, okay? Is, 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 is this, um, is your, your active, because D2 receptors will also activate ERK. I'm going to try to come back to that. I, I, I realize that I, at one point I had it the other way around, and I but switched okay. it for, to try to make it simpler, but, but you're right. Here, we're really only talking about D1 receptors. And so if we go back to some of this data that I showed up here, um, and I said that at the time, I'll, I didn't say it clearly enough, this, this is a, actually, it was this data. This, the PDARP signals are only in D1 neurons. Okay? It's about half the neurons. 65% of, of half of the neurons are being modulated, if you do the math. And in fact, the math works out uh, really quite, quite nicely. Um, okay, so that's part of this, the story. Um, and I won't go into the details, as your lab has published in some detail on that. They went, have gone on to look further into the nucleus and, and start to discriminate different effects of ERK cascades, for example, coupling phosphorylation of the transcription factor or ELK to other transcriptional events that specifically are, are more or less specifically influence different aspects of behavior, such as reward reinforcement sensitization and avoidance through coupling through different subcompartments of the signaling complexes that, uh, signaling pathways that occur within the nucleus. And that you can find in the, in the uh, literature. Most of it's uh, published. But at a kind of a more simple general level, the Jean-Antoine Giraud has, has sort of posed, based on this data, this kind of um, idea that there's a connection, a coincident interaction or synergy between D1 receptor activation and NBA receptor activation that he's called this logical AND gate, the AND being they both have to add together. So the idea simply then is that you have external internal contextual information that's mediated through glutamate inputs to the medium spiny neurons. You have dopamine that's acting as a reward prediction error signal. Um, and if they both occur in the same time in the same place, then you synergistically have this AND component that then leads to potent activation of the ERK pathway. Um, this leads to uh, change in plasticity, transcriptional events, um, event, et cetera, et cetera, that then can lead to long-term changes in selected neurons. If you only have glutamate but no dopamine, you, this is not sufficient. ERK's not activated. Vice versa, if you have dop dopamine but, sorry about that. Um, dopamine without glutamate, you have the same thing. ERK is not activated. You really need to have both of them at the same time in the same place. And so this is really simple-minded, but, but basically you can imagine a scenario that um, various signals coming from cortex to striatum would be influenced in a selected fashion by uh, release of dopamine, such that in some cases there would be specific activation of individual um, 
pathways within this uh, the, cir the circuit that would relay back and be potentiated and maintained and would be responsible for short-term and longer-term changes in behavior. Okay, so that's kind of the first little bit of the story. Um, the second bit of the story is one which is more related to signal duration and, and timing. So it's kind of some of the same stuff, but it's a little bit slight different take-home message. <coughs> and so what I'm going to talk about now is this phosphorylation event, Serine 97, within DARP, which is phosphorylated by a, um, a boringly known kinase called casein kinase 2. Uh, now called casein CK2 because the real casein kinase that phosphorylates casein in milk is a completely different entity. Um, and the idea here is that I'm going to talk about how this phosphorylation event is, is modulated with a completely different kinetics and how this uh, involves changing the localization of DARP32, changing where the signal occurs in the cell from in the initial phases from the cytosol to the later stages to the um, nucleus. And this came out <coughs> sort of somewhat serendipitously. After staring at these um, slices where we would given mice cocaine or, or amphetamine for a while, we started to, to uh, realize, in fact, the signal, most of the DARP was in the cytosol, which is where we always thought it was, and the nucleus is in these cells quite big. It's so hard sometimes it takes up the whole cell. But as we look carefully, and this is a case of cocaine for 10 minutes, the signal seemed to actually be moving more into the nucleus. And so initially we thought there was an artifact. We did a lot of controls. Um, it turned out to be really moving to the nucleus. It happened relatively quickly, and it was maintained. Um, these are minutes um, to hours. Actually, these are hours, so half an hour, one and a half hours. It was maintained a reasonable amount of time. It happened in response to various drugs, amphetamine, morphine. Um, happened in the dorsal striatum in the nucleus common shell, and here in response to morphine. It happened in response to nose poking for food reward, and, and these are active versus yoked animals that were trained to, to um, nose poke for food reward and, and dorsal or the ventral striatum DARP was um, uh, moving, apparently moving from the cytosol into the nucleus. So we thought, well, we should be able to figure this out. It's pretty straightforward. We'll just set up a striatal culture system. And we made a GFP form of DARP to make it easier to see where it was moving in, in the cell. And we will just mutate the various phosphorylation sites, and I'm sure we were sure it was going to be this P P34 site that made the most sense. Um, so we set this up. We can stimulate with a D1 agonist SKF. We can get DARP to go from the cytosol. So this is a ratio of nucleus over cytosol. We stimulate D1 agonists. They all, all, mostly all goes into the nucleus. But if we mutate this residue to alanine, it doesn't change the baseline. It doesn't really change the stimulated state. We do the same to 375. It doesn't do anything. We do the same to serine 130. It doesn't do anything. But if we mutate the serine 97 to alanine, we'd see two things. One is that the baseline level comes up, and it's no longer modulated by SKF. So what's going on? So the model, in fact, we completely had it wrong what, where we thought DARP <coughs> was in the cell. At the steady state level, when we look <coughs> statically, the DARP looks like it's in the cytosol, and it's in the cytosol because it's phosphorylated at serine 97, and it's in conjunction very close to what's called a nuclear export signal. So this is a signal that pumps things out of the nucleus. So things, a lot of things go into the nucleus, but if you don't want them in the nucleus, you get them out of the nucleus as quickly as possible. And they use these signals called nuclear export signals to interact with nuclear pore proteins that allow this to, and other molecules to get this to work. So in reality, what, we, what, what DARP is doing all the time is actually shuttling in and out of the nucleus very, very rapidly. But the steady state favors this phosphorylated form that's in the cytosol. So you look at baseline, you see it all here. But in fact, it's going in and being pumped out as fast as it can. And it's part of a, a loop where there's, there's a kinase. The kinase actually, CK2, is more enriched in the <coughs> nucleus, so this helps. If any printing gets into the, to the nucleus, it gets phosphorylated and it gets pumped, pumped out. But what, why, why might it be regulated? So we, we started to say, well, maybe PKA somehow regulates this phosphorylation event. Um, and so um, the next few slides describe the mechanism for that. So for this, I want to get back to the idea that the protein phosphatases are actually quite interesting 
uh, beasts, and the, they're regulated in quite interesting ways. And we had been working on this enzyme called PP2A, which is a heterotrimeric assembly of a catalytic subunit, a, a, a platform um, <coughs> structural subunit, and then various types of <coughs> so-called B subunits. In one of these, the, this B um, primed or B56 delta, we prefer to call it, <coughs> turns out to be phosphorylated by PKA. And we have published papers showing that it was actually quite highly enriched in the brain in striatum. And we've shown that if we phosphorylate um, with PKA, we could activate specifically this, this form of uh, PP2A that had this B56 delta subunit. And so, in fact, what we now, based on the data that we obtained, we now believe that the PKA phosphorylates the B56 delta. This activates this, this specific form of PP2A that then uh, dephosphorylates the serine residue. And because the, the, there's less uh, phosphorylation, the steady state shifts from this form, which is in the cytosol, and builds up the protein the nucleus. So what, what might you think you would be the consequences of such a mechanism? Anything, any, what would this be useful for? Obviously, getting DARP into the nucleus, right? <coughs> Turning off PP1 in the nucleus rather than the cytosol. And so what do we know about PP1's function in, in the nucleus? So it turns out that <coughs> some of the major um, epigenetic um, modifications, like histone phosphorylation and histone acetylases and deacetylases actually interact with phosphatase 1 it's directly. And so the obvious question was, um, is DARP doing something in the nucleus? And so we looked initially at something relatively easy, <coughs> which is histone H3 phosphorylation. And we did this first in culture. But basically, when we stimulate with SKF, DARP32 would move into the nucleus. <coughs> and only in cells where we saw nuclear DARP, we would see phosphorylation of um, histone. <coughs> Similarly, if you did this in, in animals, if you stimulate uh, wild-type animals with cocaine, you'll see phosphohistone in, in striatum uh, with short-term cocaine stimulation. If you do this in either the 3 and 34 alanine mutant mice, you get no histone phosphorylation. That's because DARP just doesn't get, has no ability to inhibit PP1. But if you mutate the serine 97 to alanine, all of the DARP goes at the nucleus. It doesn't get access to the upstream signaling, and you also prevent the signal and you get no phosphorylation. And the functional significance of that was done in a number of ways. This is uh, one test with conditional place preference to cocaine, <coughs> where the serine 97 alanine mutation specifically uh, um, alters, reduces the, uh, the, the favored uh, 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 box, uh, part of the box where the, the uh, mouse would have associated the cocaine reward. So what I think is going on is, is, is the falling, and this is really where the issue of timing comes in. So initially, DARP is in this, the cytosol. It's actually can be in the spine, or close to the spines in the dendrites. It's, it's all through the cell. It's there because it's phosphorylated on serine 97. It's been pumped out of the nucleus. It's not in the 3 and 34 form. <coughs> if you stimulate with drugs of abuse or various types of learning paradigms, you activate uh, dopamine D1 receptors. Initially, the DARP gets phosphorylated on the 3 and 34, where it inhibits PP1 locally, either at synapses or in the cytosol. But if you keep hitting the system hard enough, then you get activation of this, this so in a, de a delayed fashion, the PP2A mechanism. This causes dephosphorylation of serine 97, get the steady state shift of DARP into the nucleus, where it then is able to inhibit nuclear DARP, uh, sorry, inhibit nuclear PP1. At the same time, this then increases the action of kinase such as MSK1, which is the histone uh, serine 10 kinase, and you get much more phosphorylation of histone. This is a marker for active transcription. And so this leads to long-term effects um, based on these, um, these timing-dependent, uh, signal intensity-dependent mechanisms. <coughs> so basically, we think this is a timing mechanism that helps to take the system to respond to, to strong signals. You said it takes an hour and a half for it to accumulate? Can take, <coughs> you can take yeah, half an hour to an hour and a half. It obviously depends on the signal <coughs> exactly and signal intensity, the dose of the drug, um, things like that. But yeah, it 
I think it's a combination of a number of those things. If we do it biochemically in a, in a slice preparation, for example, or in a whole animal, it's a little harder to get to control the deep phosphorylation and get the dissection done. You clearly see a delay between the initial phosphorylation of this site and the phosphorylation of the site that occurs on this guy by, by, a, by a number of minutes. So there's, there is a built-in delay. Um, you know, we could theoretically work it out based on the, the kinetics of these guys, but our back-of-the-thumb envelope calculation sort of agrees with this, what we see. So there's, there's an inbuilt delay because of this process. And then, I think, and then this process also has to change too. And is there any reason why all of the DARP32 might need to make it to the nucleus? Like we were saying <coughs> earlier, maybe only a few copies, right? From so I, actually, I think all of it does it sometime. It, all, it lives its life in the nucleus for some finite type. It's all going to the nucleus. It has an NLS. Go, you know, why this happens, there are a number of examples, kinases that you want to put in. You don't want it to, to you know, like chem kinase 1. It goes in the nucleus and it's pumped out really fast because you don't want it spuriously phosphorylating things that would until you want it to happen. <clears throat> so I, I, this is one of many examples where um, a lot of proteins go through the nucleus and then selectively are retained or removed depending on what you want to do with them. So we're actually working on some other work which suggests that potentially <clears throat> glutamate signals, if, so glutamate without dopamine may be able to actually cause dephosphorylation of the site and sequester DARP in the nucleus. It actually may be removing it from the system and stopping it. And, and uh, it gives another layer of how this glutamate off, you know, non-coincident non glutamate and uh, dopamine uh, may be um, involving sequester sequestration of DARP in the nucleus to get it away from the signal. So there are a bunch of ways you could design the system. Okay, so... Um, where are we at now? We're going to 12.30, and it's almost 12.30, right? That's all right. <coughs> so <coughs> we have time. We have time. Uh, <coughs> so, okay, let me think about what I will do for the next couple of minutes. So we'll take a quick look. It's good to have two computers. You can start figuring that out. Okay, so, yeah, so I think, I think I can go through this pretty fast. Some of it's really easy um, stuff. Actually, I, I cribbed this, some of it from a presentation I was supposed to give at an advisory board meeting for our neuroproteomics center. And I put myself last because I knew everybody would be slow. So I had it like a 30-minute talk that I could do in 15 minutes, 10 minutes. When I got up, there was only two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I managed to do it in two minutes. So it's actually, you never know. <laughs> uh, okay, so this has come up a few times, and, and obviously... Um, what I've been telling you in terms of medium spiny neurons is really kind of only half the story, right? Because you already know that D1 and D2 receptors are probably largely <coughs> separated. And so, you know, what's happening with D2 receptors? And, and I say D2 receptors can lower cyclic AMP levels, but if there's no D1 receptor, what are they working against? And so I'll answer that simply. We think it's the A2A receptor that's providing a tonic cyclic AMP signal that the D2 receptor is then able to antagonize. And there's a lot of data. I'm not going to get into that, but that pretty, seems pretty clear. Um, what I will do, though, is, is um, uh, kind of just summarize kind of histor little his history. Is that it's sort of ironic that if you go back and look 20 years ago, the idea of basal ganglia classical circuits that were involved in movement actually already had posed the, uh, taken the idea that the, the direct pathway was largely influenced positively by the D1 receptor system, and the indirect pathway was largely negatively influenced by the D2 receptor. Then there was a period of confusion, um, and I won't go through this for the sake of time, but the confusion came up because people started to look for the, with bad antibodies to D1 receptors and D2 receptors and said they're in the same cells, um, they did in situ hybridization and, and with amplification protocols that were basically, you know, not in the right, not linear range. Um, they did single cell PCR. It was the same problem that, that they were getting stuff that was saying that, you know, 50% of the cells had both receptors, which was clearly just, was just an error. <coughs> and then there was some biochemistry, <coughs> Anto alluded to some of the types of experiments he did where people put D1 and D2 receptor agonists onto slices, for example, and they saw synergistic effects that seemed to be only explicable if the receptors were in the same place. 
But I think the, the field has shifted back. I think we really now think, particularly because of the use of these back transgenic mice and other uh, approaches that the, in, in the medium spiny neurons that D1 and D2 subclasses are segregated into roughly into two halves. D1 is localized with substance P dinorphin. They're the direct pathways. The D2 is localized with enkephalin. These are the indirect. Um, but things like the important proteins that, I, that we study, like DARF32, are in all the medium spiny neurons. So, so they have to exist with different types of signaling pathways. And I won't get into this, but one of the reasons I think we have these complex um, signaling pathways associated with DARP and phosphatase is, is actually we want to do, we're not just turning one on in one cell, we're turning one the same pathway off in another cell, and we have to kind of bring them up and down in a controllable fashion. I think that's why all the complexity is in there, um, because it gives us much more control of the shaping of those responses, both on, a, on the on side as well as on the off side. So we, you've probably seen some of these pictures. These are generated by the GenSat group where they coupled the uh, D2 promoter to, to expression of uh, GFP. This shows the, uh, the, the indirect pathway neurons that stop in the globus pallidus. Uh, the D1 uh, uh, projection neurons, the direct pathway project all the way through the globus pallidus to, to the to terminals in the Niagara. These have been used by an, in a number of different ways by a number of investigators. Um, I'll summarize some of that data. But you know, one of the, one more quantitative pieces of work was done by the Giro lab. So they looked at you know, so we know that DARP is on in 95 percent, probably 100 percent of all medium spiny neurons. So if you look at co-localization of DARP with uh, the D1 uh, promoter mice with GFP, you get about 55 percent of the DARP positive mice are D D1 positive. For the D2, it's about 45 percent. This is <coughs> dorsal striatum, <coughs> which means there's probably about a five percent co-localization. So is it in these cells with 5% co-localization that you get dimerization of receptors and you get different signals? Are the, um, are, 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 you know, it doesn't really matter that you get this co-localization. I mean, those are important questions. If you look in the commons, the overlap is, is more. It's about 17%. So obviously there's some differences there. And again, you ask the same questions and we need the right tools to be able to interrogate that because uh, it's hard you just if you manipulate just the, the D1 cells or the D2 cells, you're probably not going to be able to get at this overlapping population. So clever people are going to have to come up with clever approaches. <clears throat> and this is what I alluded to earlier. But if you look at um, response in a whole animal to cocaine, and look at uh, histone H3 response, then um, it's only in the D1 cells. So th it's a little maybe a little misleading here. But you only see in the merge, you see sig orange signals because of the mix of red and green. But if you look in the D2 cells, you only see red because it's not localizing with the D2 cells. And there's a lot of data like this. It really looks like the vast majority of the D1 and D2s are segregated. Cholinergic engine neurons express both D1 and D2. Do they express DARP32? No. I mean, maybe at trivial levels, but based on the backtrap data that's available, it's very low. And the antibodies are really, we, we, we published, you know, EM, a whole bunch of things 30, 25 years ago, and it looks pretty clean. Um, so there are differences in, in the two cells, um, as people like Jim Sermar have, have shown, the, the, the D1 cells have more dendrites, more branches compared to the D2 cells. Um, they have, uh, uh, if you do the single cell PCR the right way, you do see the specific cell enrichment uh, of the D1 receptor and substance P in the D1 cells, uh, and Keflin and D2 receptors in the D2 cells. And so you can kind of go back retrospectively and work out your conditions to figure out which ones are the right ones. <coughs> they do have different electrical properties. I'm not going to get into any details on that. <coughs> there have been a number of re reviews published. Um, this, was, this was a nice summary from a few years ago from the Giro lab if you want to go back. But there are Changes in, in morphology. There's changes in plasticity. Dif changes or differences in plasticity <coughs> between the two types of cells. It's a little complicated to summarize quickly. So I, if you're interested, you should go back and read the <coughs> source material. What I will do is I just want to focus a little bit on the intracellular signaling because I think that's it's in relative to the rest of the talk. Um, I've already said a little bit about specificity for p hist phosphohistidine. Fossil ERK similarly is only largely in D1, but what about DARP? So, <coughs> so Helen Badup, 
<coughs> who was a, a student in the Gringard lab, did a nice study a number of years ago now, um, where she took the D1 promoter or the D2 promoter and uh, made mice that uh, put the D1 uh, promoter upstream of a form of DARP with a flag tag on it, so a little tag that you can use to immunoprecipitate. Or in the D2 mice, you made a DARP form that had a MIC tag on it that you could immunoprecipitate with a different antibody. Then mated the mice, so you had a mice line that had both the, the flag and the MIC forms. And the key thing that these are reporter molecules, they're expressed about 1% of the endogenous DARP, so they don't change things very much. They're really reporters. And then set up an experiment. Initially, she looked to confirm, so these are kind of examples of some of the, the pictures that you see again. <coughs> With flag versus mix, there's really no overlap. <coughs> and this is not a selected field. This is really very, very um, robust finding. So what might you <coughs> predict then if you do your experiment um, and you stimulate these animals with, with cocaine? You would think DARP phosphorylation at 3 34 should go up in the D1 neurons, but does it go down in the D2 neurons, right? So in fact, that's what happens. So if you look at the total DARP, which you can do uh, with plus antibodies that are selected for the 3734 site, what you see in the total DARP, you get a small increase uh, with cocaine. This is, I think, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so with uh, 20 mix for cocaine. But in fact, all of the increases in the D1 cells. So if you specifically precipitate the D1 uh, cell form of DARP, you get all the phosphorylation increases in the D1, but you get a decrease in the D2. So in fact, the signal, the noise of your total, if you went in and dissected your sample out, is really against you to actually find any changes because in th these cells are sitting beside each other. You can't separate them. And so as a biochemist, that's a real real problem if your signal, the noise is, it gets to the point that it's in the background and it's, you can't actually measure things. And so it's really because of this it's sort of proof of principle that I think you really have to start thinking about what's the protein changes that are occurring selectively in these different types of neurons. So I won't go, I'm for the sake of time, I won't go through this, but, but Helen followed that up with, a, with a, another paper where she knocked out selectively using D1 Cree and D2 Cree in a flux DARP mice to look at the, uh, the functional effects of DARP within the D1 cells versus the functional effects of DARP within the D2 cells. I won't go through the data. The data makes sense. Um, DARP is contributing to plasticity, to behavioral effects both in D1 and D2, but it does it in different directions. Okay, um, I think Anto alluded to, to these dreads earlier. Um, I won't say anything much more, but you can start to do some acute things. So, um, you know, one of the things is can we control cyclic AMP levels in the D2 cells? So, Brian Ross lab, in conjunction with Karan et al., um, may use one of these dread um, uh, muscarinic, modified muscarinic receptors that you can specifically um, an, uh, agonize with a selected drug. And they expressed it only in the indirect uh, stridopalatal neurons downstream of the A2A receptor and started to perturb cyclic AMP levels up and down using this approach. And, and one can start to think of other approaches that you might be able to manipulate things. Okay, so because of this, um, particularly because of the DARP work from Helen Beta, but really has, has changed our thinking that we really need to take our neuroproteomic studies to the, to the same level um, of, of, uh, to get at specific neuronal populations, particularly in the case of dopamine. And so I'm going to run through this really fast. It's pretty simple. The take-home message is really simple, <coughs> is that we have to do it. So why do we have to do it? The first thing is <coughs> you're going to hear from Eric Nessler on, on Sunday, I guess, uh, talk about RNA expression. Everybody likes RNA-seq. But uh, the bottom line is that studying RNA is not studying protein. Um, so in fact, there's a really poor relationship between levels of mRNA levels and protein levels. I mean, this is done, you can look at this, this uh, different scenarios. This is a really nice paper that came out a couple of years ago. If you look at the total number, so the cellular half-life of an mRNA is about nine hours. The cellular half-life of a protein is 46 hours. The number of copies of an mRNA, the, the median is 17. The median number of copies of protein is 16,000. If you look at the relationship between half-life of protein and mRNA, there's no relationship at all. If you look at the relationship between um, 
protein and, and levels and, and mRNA levels, it's, it's about, uh, the cor correlation is about 40%. So you simply can't just take RNA data or epigenetic data and simply say that's going to be a change in the protein. You need to look at the proteins. Obviously, there's a lot of levels of transcriptional translational control. There's protein uh, degradation. There's microRNAs that are providing local regulation of RNA expression. Um, but in, in, in any event, it, you have to look at the protein. Um, what it looks like is that the reason that there's, oh, this, this comes about is that there are mechanisms that control the overall rate of production of proteins, not specifically the rate, but the amount of protein that's made. It's a compl complex model, but basically um, the translational rate is, 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 is modulated at the level of the ribosome probably. Now this is not um, obviously a new problem. Um, it's an old problem. Cahal recognized it. We know that different neurons have different shapes, and as, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, the idea of having a, uh, um, you know, a barcode that will identify gene expression. At the same time, I think we need a protein barcode because it's, that's going to be a better readout of the, what's going on. Um, but obviously, as already alluded, this presents really major limitations in terms of signal and noise. And then we have other things that go on in, pro in neurons, so uh, they have different compartments. We can get local protein synthesis, local proteasome-mediated degradation. Um, we have uh, all these PTMs that we've talked about. So if we're going to understand protein function and how it relates to uh, neuronal function and behavior, we're going to have to actually study proteins. Um, now, some methods, such as the backtrap method that's been mentioned, um, and the ribosomal profile methods from uh, the Weissman lab may take us closer from the mRNA to the protein, and I think that needs to be looked at. But, um, uh, and, and for those of you who don't know the backtrap technique, um, the backtrap technique was developed by the Green Garden Heinz labs using the GenSat back promoters, but instead of driving expression of GFP, as is shown here, what they did was they, dro they drove a GFP tagged a ribosomal subunit, L10 large uh, ribosomal subunit, in specific neuronal subpopulations and then immune precipitated the polysomes just from that um, neuronal subpopulation and then did a microarray and now RNA-seq to look at the, um, the profiling of uh, gene expression within those individual cells. And there are now something like 120 backtrap lines available from the Heinz lab and as Jonathan mentioned, there's a new P30 grant that's give, giving money to Nat to make more lines, and so anybody who's interested in a specific line, get in touch with, with Nat, because he may be able to help, help you out, because we're, we're at the moment we're just prioritizing which things we really would like that we don't have. Um, but this wor method works really well. It gives a lot of information about specific um, neurons and how their, their, their gene expression is altered within their neurons. Um, another approach has been uh, taking out similar ideas from Huang et al. came out a couple of years ago, a, a year ago, where they used the same approach to express tagged argonaut proteins and used that, that to mere precipitate microRNAs to get a picture of the specific microRNAs that are um, being expressed in the same neurons that you might want to see the gene expression. So that will probably help. Um, but you know, can we, can we keep up? Can neuroproteomics keep up and complement these neurogenomic approaches? And so I think we can, but it's a challenge. We can't amplify proteins. That's a big problem. We get what we get. <laughs> and so um, we're going to have to come up with better ways to approach this, this, this problem. Um, but we need to because these other fields, optogenetics and, and uh, all these other cute uh, methods that, that people are using are moving ahead very rapidly, and, and we're kind of lagging behind. We have to sort of try to play catch up. Um, so I won't go through the details too much, we're sort of running out of time, but, but uh, basically the approach that we want to take is to, 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 to use mass spectrometry to study proteins, it's probably the best way we can do it, it's the most sensitive, we can look at the animal to femtomoral level proteins uh, and peptides, so it's, it's within the range that we, we probably want, but we have to be clever about it, we have to be quantitative, we have to understand experimental design and factors that affect technical and bi biological variants. And there are a bunch of specific challenges in the CNS that I've already alluded to. So I'm just going to mention one, one, or, one or two things that we're, we're doing. Um, so we have all these, these transgenic mice. Can we do something with them? Well, you might think, well, maybe we could fax art. <coughs> that makes sense, right? And you might hear a little bit about that. I don't know if 
William's going to talk about that. So initially, I was very skeptical about, about fact sorting, but I, I'm coming around. So, um, but we might, instead of looking at whole neurons, because the problem with neurons is they've got different bits. So maybe we should look at bits of them um, and look at subproteomes using rapid methods. So um, our idea was to look at things like nucleus, mitochondria, synaptic vesicles, uh, to divide up the problem and see if we can get it to work. Um, and then in, t in concert, develop mass spec methods that, that will allow these uh, analyses to happen. So, so here's a question. So I said that we have these um, backtrap mice. Um, so where, where are ribosomes assembled? Where do you make your ribosomes initially? Sorry? Initially. Initially, yeah. <coughs> Anybody? No cell biologists here? The nucleus, the nucleolus. Right. So, in fact, it turned out, fortuitously, all these backtrap mice have got labeled nuclei. So, we thought, well, let's exploit that, and we can, we're interested in epigenetics, so we can go after nuclei. That's a good start. So, uh, uh, Emmanuel Jardy, who's a student uh, who was in the Giraud lab, who worked with me in the Gringard lab over well, the last couple of years, we just published this paper. So basically, what she said was a method that we can take the D1 and D2 backtrap mice and then set up this uh, permeabilization and fixation methodology to fax, um, either fax analyze or fax sort nuclei, and it works really nicely. We can separate the, the, uh, the, the nuclei. We have to separate singlets, so we don't want the things aggregating together, so there's a bunch of technical things to do this. But we get really nice enrichment of the sorted nuclei from... Um, we're talking about 90, 000, 60 to 90,000 nuclei here, so it's not a lot. You get about half a microgram of protein at the end. Um, but it's enough to um, do some Western blots. And so um, we looked initially at histone phosphorylation and acetylation, and not unexpectedly we see by Western blot or by fax anal analyzer, we see uh, specific effects of uh, acute cocaine on um, histone uh, uh, H3S10 only in the D1 nuclei, but not in the D2. Um, we can expand that and look at other, other changes. Um, but uh, what we really start to see is we, if we multiplex this, and it's, it's, it's amenable to multiplexing in the analyzer mode, um, you can start to see differential effects of acute versus more chronic uh, 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 exposure to cocaine in terms of initial effects on different methylation states. And uh, shown here, and uh, it's a little bit too small to see the detail, but differences between D1 and D2 cells, different temporal effects, and no effects here, for example, effects in the D2 cells, but at chronic levels, you see more effects in the D1 cells, not the D2 cells. And so we're expanding this methodology, and I think it has a lot of utility, particularly if we can take these um, nuclei and actually do much more multiplex mass spec that will give us uh, ideas about a lot of the epigenetic mar markers, just not these selected ones. <coughs> This is done one mice by one mice. So we have the method working with one. One mice gives us about 90,000 nuclei. And we set up a, a 96 well plate format that we put about, I think it's about 5,000 nuclei into each well. And then um, we only have to actually count in the fax analyzer about, we, we just have to count enough to, to the signals to noise becomes, uh, but, but it's not all the sample. So it's, it's doable. I, I, it's an interesting, the paper just came out, there's some interesting nuances if you look at the, an, the fax analysis, analysis um, where the software works, is you start to see in, interesting things that in some cells you get all or none effects and for some of the epigenetic marks, in other cells you get graded effects. It's, it's actually kind of cool and we don't really understand it yet, but I think it'd be interesting. Um, okay, so the last thing I just want to say, so the other approach we were, we were working on in this um, uh, as we as this fax method came up, but we we start with thinking, well, can we target things like mitochondria? And so the first one that we worked really uh, got working is we we find an extra a cytoplasmic protein on mitochondria called FIS1 that we coupled to EGFP, and I won't go through all the details, but we use a rapid magnetic um, uh, uh, affinity method to isolate my mitochondria from cells. It works. We make them. We with our, our purified, um, and what we're, what we're in the middle of doing is putting them back into the cells of interest. So the first uh, mice that we made, we actually targeted the dopamine neurons um, using the, the DAP promoter, 
It's all right. I'm almost done. No, it's a noise. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a bell. I think it's a bell playing or somebody's playing bell. Oh, whatever. Okay. Um, so <laughs> the, f the first mice we created, we, we were interested, obviously, in all the dopamine cells, but we decided to use the DAP promoter that was mentioned by uh, Bob Edwards earlier uh, to express um, the, the mitochondrial tag just in the dopamine neurons. Um, basically, it works. We have, uh, we have mice um, now uh, that have gone through a number of generations that uh, they're uh, we can see signal in, and this is in, in dorsal striatum, but also we see in the v, in the uh, in the Nigra or the VTA, we see the expression of our tag mitochondrial markers. We're in the middle of optimizing the, the purification methodology and optimizing the mass spec to kind of bring these th two things together. We're putting these things into viruses as we as we go through. So the hope is that we'll have, you know, in con in, in conjunction with these conditional flux, um, uh, conditional cream mice we'll be able to put these things into different um, cells and, and give them out to people to use. And so hopefully, uh, you know, in a year or so, um, if we don't run out of money uh, and we get our neuroproteomics center um, renewed, and Jonathan's not here, <laughs> uh, but you can, t <laughs> you can tell him, uh, you know, we'll be able to continue this work and, and, and at least we'll be um, uh, hopeful that we can move the sort of neuroproteomics field to the same sort of level as some of these other uh, omic uh, effects. And so, I'm going to skip over a couple of things. I can, we've done a lot of DIP method development um, in bioinformatics and, and uh, things, a whole bunch of things have to be done. But, um, but I think, you know, you guys are the next generation. Some of you may end up working in a lab that might be interested in molecular events, putting events. You know, I think there are a lot of ideas that one could, could use to start to bring about the ability to target um, specific parts of the, the, the nerve cell or particular circuits. And so, you know, for example, you may be able to use some of these viral ta tags where one can then look at a presynaptic element that's tagged with a marker and a postsynaptic element and use a fact sort method to isolate just that, that part of the synaptic contact and actually start to see local changes and maybe not at the level of one cell, but at a reasonable level, population level, that you'll get useful biochemical information. Um, proof of principle has actually come from work done by Brian Scheidt and Nat Heinz. We were able to uh, pull down specific excitatory or inhibitory synapses from transgenic mice and done mass spec. We need to get better quantitation. We need to know some of the reasons for variation in the data. But uh, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, fa I think facts will be very useful in this regard. And those are some of the things that we and others are doing and uh, hopefully we'll do we more of in the future. Targeting either something with a presynaptic compartment or the postsynaptic compartment is enough to separate the two specific elements. That's, the that's, a, that's a, you know, really when it comes down to it, and it, this is the case for any of these isolation methods, it was the case for the backtrap in particular. It was just... Uh, it was five years more probably of trying different conditions to, to get specific enrichment and not have the things that you want. It was uh, like really trivial, detergent, salt, different combinations, um, different size of beads, magnetic, be you know, different coupling lengths. Uh, it really depended on the specific challenge and unfortunately you need somebody with the right mentality to not be bothered by lack of success for a while. But, you know, for example, we were purifying, like this postdoc in my lab who's purifying mitochondria, she got it, it was working, but it was, we were pulling out a lot of stuff because things would aggregate. And I just like, well, I said, well, why don't you use the, the powdered milk stuff you use for running your blots? Maybe that'll do something, right? It's just, I mean, she looked at me, she's like, so she tried it and it worked, you know? Um, and that kind of led us to another, to modify and And so, it's kind of trial and error. You have to know kind of the limitations. You also, and this is more why I think you need to be as quantitative as you can be. You need to have some sense of what the signals are. You need to know the amount of materials you're, you want to interrogate. And you need to know then how, how much do you need to increase your signal to noise. So you may not need to, you may need to get data, you may, not, you may only have to increase your signal to noise fivefold. So it may not be you need to get absolute purity, right? You, you just have to get enough of the thing you're interested in because with sophisticated bioinformatics and data analysis, you can normalize out a lot of the variables. Um, so 
I mean, not the variables, but the non-variables, and, and go for the things that you're interested in. So, so you have to look at those and 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 balance them against each other. Okay, so that's I'm done. Yeah, sorry, questions, questions yeah. To Matt's question, given that we have populations of cells like the colonic in our neurons that have dopamine receptors but no dark blue too, do you think these dopamine receptors in these cells have a much different role, or do you think it's just going through different transduction mechanisms? So I can answer that in a couple of different ways. <clears throat> So if you if you knock DARP out, and I didn't show the data, it's published. You can go back and look. It it doesn't. The, the animals survive. Um, they have altered behavior to reward based stimuli. Um, they have other uh, reproductive um, issues because there's dopamine receptors in the hypothalamus and various other places. Uh, but what what you see is you basically you can get the animals to to respond to cocaine, but you just have to give them ten times more, not ten times, but significantly more. Okay, you shift the dose response curve way to the right, and you can you can still get stimuli. So, so a lot of these core pathways, like the ERK pathway, for example, will still get activated. It may be that in a knockout scenario, you actually upregulate some other signaling pathways like serotonin receptors or other things that will actually compensate a little bit. Um, but things probably are just not working as efficiently and as effectively. So, 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 so the answer to the question is, you know, what happens in cells that wouldn't normally have dark? Well, you probably might engage a different receptor com complex to, 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 to get the, whatever the signal you want. But what I, I would argue that the objective is is, is a different objective in terms of a signaling pattern or a shape in those neur those neurons compared to the medium spiny neurons. And medium spiny neurons are behaving because they've got to integrate a certain amount of information from different parts of the brain with this, the right in the right time frame, select certain information and relay it to other places. And and to to for the whole system to work, it's set up in a way that 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 I've told you about that that this. DARP system, these phosphatases play a really critical role. They're expressed a hundred times higher there than they are in you know, the cells in the cortex, for example. So there's something unique about the temporal spatial um, relationship that you're trying to solve uh, in those cells that is a, has evolved to that point. So. In the dendrites. Mm -hmm. So, so how do, how do you see that? That should take a little while. You know, traffic all the way along and then back and then. That's that's a conundrum which you know has faced this work that I alluded to from Dizeros initially and in Dick Chen's lab. So, I may propose that there was a, some sort of protected calmodulin complex that didn't lose its calcium and somehow the signal was able to get it get from the dendrites down to the nucleus. I, I mean, I think that's possible. I, I just don't find it very likely. Um, you know, I, th I mean, obviously, you've got a situation in, you know, any any of the things that I talked about, any of the phosphorylation, dephosphorylation reactions, or any of the PTMs, they have the, you know, the kinases have on and off rates, the phosphatases have on and off rates. It's a, it's a, you're looking at a population event, steady state, all these things are reversible, easily reversible, um, assuming that you have, you know, e enough ATP there, the cell is healthy. <coughs> um, so I think, you know, I, you, I, what you see it would be more, you know, the information would be passed because the kinase that would then talk to the next molecule and then there would be a phosphatase and, it would, you know, the information would be relayed, I think, molecule to molecule to molecule. I mean, if you look at um, there's not been very much work in neurons, but if you look at some of the dynamics of there's been a little bit from Sobeth's lab on PKA signaling, um, and uh, also some work from a guy at Duke who look at G protein uh, signaling. I forget the Japanese guy's name. Yeah. Um, there's been more work in uh, 
in from Roger Chen's lab in in cell lines. Uh, so clearly, the you know you activate PKA. If you activate it a little bit, it'll be local. If you activate it a lot, it'll go further away, and it'll go to the nucleus, and then it'll come back again. Um, so depends on strength of signal, depends on shape of cell, depends how far you have to go. Uh, I think all of the, you know, but, but it's, these things have the ability to move within the cell. Some cases they'll be, have a phosphorylation will go with them. <laughs> um, there are other ways to do it, which um, we haven't actually looked very much at in terms of the DARP system, but <clears throat> there are proteins that bind to phosphorylated proteins and prevent their dephosphorylation. So you can imagine cases where you could sequester something that they would then all go as a signal and that would help. So things like that can happen. <laughs> Uh, we have a project in the lab, yeah, um, that we, I've worked on this for a long time at kind of a low level in terms of um, translational control. Uh, I, I, I think that um, local protein synthesis definitely exists. Um, it made a lot more sense when there were only a few mRNAs that might get to where they might be locally synthesized, and there were some good, I think, good examples of that. Um, you know, Mark Mayfler's work on alpha chem kinase 2, which you can clearly show is the mRNA is targeted and you can make a mouse without the 3' UTR element that takes it out there and you can see that there's less chem kinase 2 at the synapse. <coughs> but with um, Aaron Schumann's recent work, it's kind of muddied the waters because she's saying there's a lot of <laughs> mRNAs that are there. And then she's saying there are also some in the axons and some are they in the terminals and we've worked on that hard and negatively. <laughs> um, you know, you can't see rough VR in terminals, for example. There's definitely some in axons. Um, there's good evidence that local protein synthesis occurs during development, um, in axonal development, but, um, and probably in dendritic development, but exactly what's going on in, in, in uh, adult neurons, I think there is, but it's, it, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, to be learned. Yeah, yeah. So we work on the kinase called elongation factor two kinase, which is is uh, been shown by um, uh, Aaron Schumann's lab and and others to be locally regulated. But in response to minis, for example, um, the first author whose name escapes me went to Michigan. Um, Mike Sutton <coughs> has has shown very local control, calcium dependent control of uh, elongation. In, in dendrites, and so that relates to the proteins being locally synthesized. So it definitely, ha it definitely is, the regulation is there, it definitely works. Um, functional consequences is still unclear. Wondering, um, how the receptors for dopamine are se selected? I mean, how, uh, there is any cross recognition between serotonin and dopamine in terms of um, activation of <coughs> so uh, somebody asked me this question at the break, or uh, yeah. So we sort of touched on this a little bit. Um, so there are a couple of things. One is uh, you can actually do experiments. Most of the best, the easiest controlled experiments are in tissue slices, kind of for a similar reason that Anto said. Um, we uh, people in Gringar Lab have exploited those um, preparations, and there's a published data showing. Virtually every agonist for every receptor that you might think might be in a striatal slice, we've, we've looked at it. And, you know, it's a quantitative um, discussion on, on one hand. I mean, you see changes. Sometimes, the, you know, the dopamine res response is the most robust, and you see other responses that are less robust. In some cases, you see some responses uh, uh, modulate the dopamine response in different ways. So I could point you in the direction of those, those publications. It's, We've never really, um, we've, we've reviewed it, we've written about it, we've drawn pretty pictures with lots of stuff. Uh, but in fact, that was actually before we really had the ability to look at D1 and D2 cells. So in fact, there's probably a lot more fine detail that we, we, we missed. In fact, we probably missed stuff because it was going up in one cell and down in another cell and it just averaged out to nothing. And so I think <coughs> we, we, 
you know, it's hard to encourage somebody to go back and do that type of thing, but, but it probably needs to be done at some level. Um, so the other thing is we, you know, we now know better from the, the genetic profiling, the gene array uh, analyses of the D1 and D2 cells. There's gene um, uh, RNA-seq data for the interneurons now. Um, there's data in knockouts uh, for the, the gene expression. There's data in response to drugs of abuse of different types. So you can go to that literature, and, and if you can get access to the, the supplementary material, you can go down and see which receptors are expressed, and, and you know that may would help you say which things might be um, uh, influencing signaling. The converse of that, though, is if you know if you do something like a knockout, then you may be perturbing, you may be seeing compensatory effects in some of these pathways to make up for the luck loss, and so then you have to be careful. Right, I mean, we're not dealing with too many players here, cyclic AMP, calcium, <laughs> you know, so um, they're, all, they're all being shared by, um, by these, these pathways. And in fact, you know, that's something to really think about. We didn't get there, I, but I talk about numbers. I mean, one of the things about these signaling molecules is that they're, they're in limited supplies. They may be super abundant, like the calmodulin, which is, you know, it's thought to be, um, you know, it's, 100 micromolar in cells or whatever, it's actually the, there's less calmodulin than can be shared by all the calmodulin binding proteins. So there's always competition. Um, in the case of DARP, we know there's about 100 micromolar DARP. There's actually more DARP than there are the phosphatases that it inhibits. So that sets up a different scenario. Um, so you have to look at those, those sort of quantitative numbers to, to assess these sort of things. Um, 